And uh, um, I still question whether that per uh, uh, the person named was the inside person, but that's another question. But <laughs> right. Well, uh, but but before before we uh, continue on here with John O'Connor, of course, his latest book is Postgate, and uh, we've got Don Mazzella with us today. We are going to go to Josh Bernstein. Uh, he, of course, is from the Josh Bernstein Show, and uh, we were talking a little. There it is, Truth, the new hate speech. Great T-shirt, <laughs> sir. Um, tell us a little bit about this uh, Kamala Harris stuff that you've that you've uncovered here. Well. First off, um, you know, uh, I just want to say that, through a lot you know, of thought, through a lot of thought and uh, a lot of prayer, um, I've, decided um, I've decided now to be much more pro-mask. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> I've decided now that uh, I'm going to be more pro-mask. So you're just wearing it. You're just wearing the the old the old Bray Wyatt sheep mask. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, um, but, um, here, let me tell you about, here, Kamala, me tell Harris. You about Kamala Harris. Yes. Uh, first yes. Off, tell tell first me off, and John and Don about first this. Off, first off, she's not she's authentically not black. authentically black. She's not quote African, not, quote, American. African American. She is Jamaican. She is Jamaican and she is Indian. And she is Indian. Yeah. Now, I'm not faulting, I'm her, not for faulting that, her for that, media, but I'm faulting the media for saying that she's, African, saying that she's African American, which, which she is in not. case she is okay. not. That's okay, number one. that's number, number one. Two, number I two, I find it very ironic that the majority, that the majority of, of the base of supposed supporters of Kamala, of Kamala and, and, and the Joe ticket are out right now, are out right now rioting, rioting and looting and fighting against, and fighting police, against enforcement. police enforcement, and yet. And yet Biden put the Biden top cop from California, from California as, the general, as the attorney general on the ticket with him. Meanwhile, you have, you have Democrats, Democrats across the country right, across across the country right now legislation passing legislation to defund the police. To defund the police. I, mean, I mean, it makes zero sense, zero sense for Kamala, for to, be Kamala to be on this ticket. And the here's the number one, one thing. thing. Kamala, Kamala is, is a phony, and I'm glad that the Trump, glad that the Trump administration immediately came out with the fact that she is indeed a phony. She's a phony, She's for, a phony for a lot of reasons, but one main but reason is that she attacked, is that she attacked Joe, Biden Joe Biden for busing. She attacked, she attacked Joe, Biden Joe Biden for being close to segregationists. She has said, she has that, said she that she is in favor of reparations and, you know, for and, slavery. You know, for slavery. However, however, she has never she has never acknowledged the fact, the fact nor has the media done their, done their job, which is what right I'm going to do right now, and expose, and expose the fact that she is, that she descendant, is the descendant of slave, of slave owners. owners. Okay. That's, yes, I've heard this. Fact. That's not BS, and I'm, BS, and I'm right going to go now. through it right Listen now. To Listen to this. Kamala's father. Kamala's father. Uh, uh, Donald uh, Donald Harris, Harris who is about as close to her as, I don't know, maybe the Milky Way galaxy is to Earth, uh, said recently <laughs> in his book, which was, uh, which was uh, titled Re Reflections of a Jamaican Father, that Kamala Harris is the descendant of slave owners. Now again, I'm not faulting her for her ancestry. I'm pointing out the hypocrisy here. Kamala's father, Donald Harris, wrote the book Reflections of a Jamaican Father. In the book, Harris wrote about family's history, and in particular, that of his grandparents, which are Kamala's great-grandparents, were Jamaican slave owners. In fact, the town of Brownstown, Jamaica, was named after Hamilton Brown, her great-grandfather. Now, according to the official records of the National Archives of London, Hamilton Brown owned at least 86 slaves, 56 of which were men, 30 were women. Mr. Brown even swore an oath to to his registrar of slaves, of slaves September on September 24, 1817. 1817. Quote, Quote, I, Hamilton Brown, do solemnly swear that this list is a true and perfect list of slaves, of owned, slaves owned, by owned by me to the best of my knowledge. The of my Every, knowledge. Slave knowledge. Slave Every slave mentioned on this list has been possessed by me as owner, as owner considered as most settled, permanently settled, employed, worked and employed in the parish of St. Anne, and without fraud, deceit, or evasion, so help me God. Furthermore, in Don Harris's book, he writes, quote, as a child growing up in Jamaica, my two biggest influences in my life, besides my parents, were my two grandmothers, Missy Chrissy and Miss Iris, direct descendants to Hamilton Brown, a plantation and slave owner and the founder of Brownstown, Jamaica. 
There it is. There it is. Wow. Who's going, uh, who's going to come up with this? Does the media have the, <laughs> the, media have the balls to do this? No. Uh, no. I want to. I want to start with uh, our guest, John O'Connor, the author of Postgate. Well, well, what do you make of what Josh is saying there, John? Well, boy, that's I well, boy, that's to eye me. I know to me. Mother, I know her mother is, uh, of course, Indian. Uh, Indian, and she's of the very highest caste. There's a certain caste within a caste. She's a Brahmin, and then there's a certain portion of that that's very high, high, high born. So, uh, you know, you talk about social inequality and all this stuff and privilege. I mean, this is – she's got parents that are privileged, and she's a privileged person. She's lived a privileged life, and so the notion that somehow she represents something else is absurd. I'll say this about uh, Kamala uh, from, from living out here and uh, being in her orbit here. It's hard to say what she really believes, very frankly, because she's sort of a cipher. She does some things that sometimes seem a little bit toward the – you know traditional modes, uh, but then uh, you know, then in, in her political uh, rise, she seems to latch on to any uh, progressive idea that comes along. Oh, Green New Deal! I'll take thirty seconds to think about it. And say, yeah, I'm for the Green New Deal. Now, does she really believe it? I don't know. So, what we're really doing is, once again, everyone's going to project their own thoughts and feelings on her, and they won't know what the heck she's up to, other than the fact that we know that the entire ticket seems to have been taken over by progressives. They're dictating everything. So I think even though I, uh, so Kamala doesn't probably have a core set of principles or beliefs, but I think she's going to probably have to ride along with the progressives. isn't she, and if she does that, where is our country headed? I don't know. I don't know that, uh, that there's a good road ahead. If, if Biden's elected, there won't be. Uh, you're absolutely correct, and you're right. She does change uh, positions constantly. She's extremely far to the left. You know, this notion that she's some type of moderate and that these are moderates is absolutely outrageous. I mean, the media, I, I can't even believe they have the audacity to say that this woman is some type of a moderate. I mean, this is a woman that has voted repeatedly to uh, for term abortion. She supports the Green New Steel. She supports Medicare for All. Uh, she believes in defunding the police, which is unbelievable if you think about it as a former prosecutor and attorney general. So she will change with you know, the wind, you know, the and, wind say and say whatever she needs to say uh, in, order to uh, in order to be in a position, in a position of power. She's a very, She's a very dangerous woman. But more, important but more importantly, she doesn't resonate with people. People, people don't, don't really like her. And that's yeah. even people in the middle and on the left. She's very cold. She's very condescending. She's very nasty. She's very vitriolic. She's very uh, bitter and sarcastic and just, you know, really a, an obnoxious type of personality. And I, can't and I can't imagine that personality winning over too many people, certainly not in the middle. Yeah. Well, one of the things she's learned, let me let me jump in there. One of the things she's learned since I first started seeing her, and I uh, I had gone to, because of my buddy, I'd gone to a couple fundraisers when she was starting out as a law enforcement officer. And in California, you don't have much of a choice there, so I gave her some money. And she didn't, she, she was very bad retail campaigner. One of the things I noticed lately is she, she openly laughs all the time. Yes. Uh, she never did before. So if you, when you see pictures of her, you just think she's a cute, laughing, geekly person. It's probably the best thing she's done given TV and, and, uh, and, and media. So I think uh, it was Josh might have said that, who she is. Uh, but I think she's affected a better public persona for, uh, you know, for photo ops. And that will be probably be her strong suit. Everybody will project on her that she's this uh, nice, giggly. And, of course, in California, a moderate person is, it only believes in moderate uh, deplatforming conservative speech and moderate number of people going to a moderate re-education camp. Right. Uh, that's where we are in California. That's, that's what a moderate is. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you, know, you know what's really scary? I don't think there's a person in America that believes that the Senate... That, um, Biden, Joe Biden, will survive four years in the White House. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and uh, whoever he chose is in effect the president in waiting, and that's a scary part. Um, uh, 
you know, and that to me is the scariest part of this. Uh, and also, uh, Jiggy, uh, 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 Dan Perkins' partner, informs me that uh, Kamala was the girlfriend of Willie Brown. Um, yes, this is something uh, that I have seen the last couple uh, last couple days since this was announced. That uh, yes, uh, what 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 do you have on this, uh, Josh? Oh, well, I've been calling her for well over a year, Kamala downtown, uh, Kamala downtown, downtown, downtown on Willie Brown Harris. Brown Harris. <laughs> um, her career was, her career pretty, was pretty much started between his legs. Between his legs. Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, she has done all kinds of things in order to get into the position that she's in right now. Um, Willie admits it. Willie has said that uh, she has done certain things in order to be promoted, shall we say. Um, there's a reason we call her Headboard Harris or Heels Up Harris, because uh, clearly she is uh, probably going to have no problem with Joe sniffing on her, that's for sure. <laughs> But you know what? This is a sad commentary upon where the American political system has gone. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, I, I can I can remember, um, and I'm a lot older than you, Josh, of uh, seeing a U.S. senator beat up uh, his wife in front of a Democratic convention in Atlantic City, and no one saying a word, nobody reporting it, yep. because the private life was private life. Yet, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, uh, we have really descended into uh, 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 pettiness, and we're not talking uh, issues. We, uh, uh, you know, my question is, uh, will they have a debate or not? Uh, I, but uh, Biden, if he were smart, would avoid the debate. Yes. I think he'd be killed. But uh, what do you think about that, Josh? Well, here's what I think. I think, first off, um, if I was the Trump campaign, I would be on speed dial with Donald Harris right now and asking him to become a speaker at the RNC convention, the virtual convention, so that he can call out his daughter. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I hope that there is an actual uh, debate, debate in which, in which people actually go to the debate and it's actually somewhere, somewhere and not just because virtual because if that is, if the, that is the, the case, Trump the Trump campaign should go. Should go. And, if and if Joe Biden doesn't go and wants to do it through or Skype or whatever, President Trump, President Trump, Trump standing, standing there, there on that debate stage alone by himself, by himself and, that's and that's a visual for the American people. For the American people. In other words, the American people will be like, wow, President Trump is there. He's by himself, by himself he's going to debate him through, through a video screen, screen which, isn't fair, which isn't fair because they could be telling him and teaching him what to oh, say. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, but there's also. But President Trump could, could then really look like, really look like the true leader, true leader that he already is, is by saying, hey, Joe, I'm Joe, here. I'm here. You, know, been you know, we could have been six feet, feet apart. apart. You could have worn a mask, whatever you wanted to do. But I'm here. The American people deserve you to be here. And you can't hide in your bunker and in your basement. You should call him out on it on television. national television. So that, would be, yeah. so that would be the one thing. And then, of course, um, you know, Mike Pence and uh, Kamala Harris um, should be a very interesting debate as well. Kamala's very um, vindictive, very mean-spirited, yes. but she's not that intelligent. So if someone says something to her, she can be tripped up pretty hard. Just look at Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, Gabbard oh, yes. absolutely took her from 14, 15 percent down to 2 percent within 72 hours after her shellacking in that debate. And Kamala just sat there taking notes and smiling and smirking and didn't say anything. If I was the Trump campaign, I would run Tulsi Gabbard's, you know, a minute and a half uh, destruction of Kamala, of Kamala Harris as a campaign ad, and at the end, I would just say, "I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message." It was a great idea. Josh, last week uh, you were concerned about the, the um, older people coming out to vote, and uh, it resonated with me. And I spent uh, uh, most of this week actually uh, talking to a lot of older people about that. And I, uh, I think you really hit a nail on the head uh, with that, because there was, there is a great reluctance and fear, and I think you were very, very right well, on with that. We, we've got to, we've got to quell that fear. Um, we've got to figure out 
and we've got to tell these folks that look you know we're not asking you to storm the beaches of normandy or raise the flag on iwo jima here we're asking you to put a mask on if that's what you want to do go to the polling station and vote so that yep. you have freedom so that your children have freedom and your grandchildren have freedom. That's all, That's all we're asking you to do. And if, and if you, you know, you get sick and you die, and you die well, then, then you know, it's, you know, a, it's sacrifice a sacrifice for the country, for the country because, because you can't, can't mail it in. I'm sorry, sorry. You, you just can't do it. Can't do it. A, lot a lot of people don't like, like that. They think I'm heartless. They think I'm cruel. They think I'm insensitive. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. It's just the bottom line is that this is too important to mail it in. We cannot allow this mail-in voting to dictate this election because if we do, we're going to lose. Well, you know, well, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, I was talking to somebody today from New Jersey, where um, uh, they felt their vote was useless because in New Jersey um, there, there was simply no chance of Trump winning and, and uh, winning that state. But, but I feel that uh, uh, the vote is necessary to add to the total. The grand total. What do you say to that? I say that if, I say that if more that people have that attitude that their vote doesn't count, doesn't count then it won't yeah. count because they, because they won't vote. vote. And that's a, and that's a terrible point. attitude yeah. to have. Uh, to, say uh, to say that New Jersey, New Jersey couldn't, couldn't possibly swing in favor, in favor of, President of President Trump, Trump um, it, you know, it, it, you know it, it's a pretty strong, pretty strong blue, blue state. state. I, I would that. agree with that. I'm originally New from New Jersey, born and raised, born and raised 21, years 21 years there. there. And, so I, and so I know New Jersey extremely well, the entire state. state. I know the attitude uh, of, uh, the Jersey of the folks, Jersey folks, if you know what I mean. And there's many of them that are a kind of take no BS type of attitude. And they can see they through, can see through phoniness. phoniness. So there's a lot of Trump, supporters, lot of Trump supporters in New Jersey in different areas, in different areas of, the of the state. Of course, you do, of have, course you do have the big cities like Newark, like Newark and, Patterson and Patterson, and you know, and Camden, you know, and Camden that are going to drown out some of the suburban areas, areas and, and things like that around the state. But it's, but really it's truly a, a very diverse state. state. You've got northern New Jersey, which is very, which is very different, different, closer to the, uh, to the uh, suburbanites of New York City, if you will. A lot of them go into New York City to work. Then you have, then you have Jersey, South Jersey, which is like almost country. country. If, you real if you go real South Jersey, Jersey uh, Vineland, and, and, and some of those areas. And then you have the, area, you have the area in the middle, middle central that's Jersey, Jersey that's closer out to like Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. That That's a whole nother ball game there and then of course you have jersey city and you have hudson, and you have hudson county, county and you, county. you have so union county so you have so many different areas but you also have some country area out there in new jersey too so it's very diverse there's a lot of different people in new jersey but just like many states they're drowned out in the cities by the liberals but uh with the defund the police movement and you know all the violence and rioting uh, there could be many people that normally, that normally wouldn't vote that are just so fed up. They're like, you know what? I want to be safe. And the only one that I know is going to make me safe is Trump. And who knows what can happen. I'll tell you this. If it's close in New Jersey on election night, if it's within four or five points, that means the rest of the country is going to be, uh, you know, kind of projecting the fact that states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan are, uh, are either going to be neck and neck or having Trump win again. Because if it's close in New Jersey, or even for New York, okay, if let's just say New York is not a blowout, let's say it's not a 30-point blowout like it normally is, let's say Trump's within, I don't know, 12 to 13, 14 points, that means the rest of the country that's more conservative in the Midwest, he's going to be doing that much better. So keep an eye on New York. Keep an eye on California. If Trump is losing on election night within 12 to 15 points instead of 30, then it could be a very, very good night for the president. Let me follow up on Yeah, jump in there, John. Follow up on what Josh, is, what Josh just said. And he, he hit on something that's very important. There are a lot of people out there that are going to be shy Trump voters, as the pollsters call them. Uh, they, recently, they were identified as maybe being 5% of the people that are sampled. But I think what Josh is saying is that shy portion of the vote may be increasing with these latest riots and so forth. So right. that's going to be the big unknown, how much of that shy Trump voter is is going to be is going to show up. So it's going to be right. very interesting, and I agree with him on, on the demographics of this thing. Well, what about the fact that uh, suburban women... Um, uh, seem to be going anti-Trump. 
Well, well, that's happening. That's happening. I'm married to one, and uh, she's my weather vane. She's never been wrong in the last 84 elections, you know. I kind of pull her every day. You know, if she says that she hates George W. Bush, the headline will read, Bush plummets in the polls. Two weeks later, she says, you know, I kind of like George W. Bush, and the headline will be, Bush rises in the polls. So, uh, you know, the, the, my sampling of suburban women is that it's not going very well for Trump because in the age of COVID, when people are worried about the basics, uh, they just, you know, they blame it on Trump. And, you know, he's uh, that's magnified by the media. And also by his own style, which is kind of a bull in a china shop style, so they blame things yeah. on him. It's not good for the woman who wants a nice, safe hearth and home. It, she seems his disruptive, disruptive personality does not fit with the times. That said, as we get closer to the election, I think people have got to start thinking, and they may think, and hopefully they will think, about economics. Who is the better person to lead us back economically and get our prosperity back? On that one, if people are thinking that way, Trump wins hands down. Right. Well, you see that the unemployment is down below uh, a million um, uh, today in the, uh, the latest unemployment figures. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I We've mean, got a V-shaped recovery coming. Yeah. yeah what What do you think about that, are, Josh? Is it ten point one or is it less than that? Because. Um, I think I predicted a couple of months ago that he would get down to about 9.8, 9.9%. So I was pretty close if he's at 10.1. And I think that if he can somehow reach 9%, 8.8, 8.9%, 8 somewhere around there, around Election Day, uh, even 8.5%, then uh, I think he'll be in very good shape because, you know, then you'll have gone from 14 all the way down to 8%, and all these jobs will be coming back. So... I think that would be really good. But one thing that I will touch on in what you said about suburban women, suburban women that are married with children are much more uh, in tune with voting for President Trump. Uh, one of the reasons he won the election was because of those types. It's single women that maybe live in the suburbs or in the city that is his, yeah. you know, his Achilles heel. But when it comes to a family that has children, I can't imagine a mother with children thinking to herself, gee, I really don't like his tweets, but I kind of want little Johnny and little Sally to get murdered in the street because of these rioters and looters, and we can't call the police. I can't imagine that, that conversation going on in someone's head and saying, because I don't like President Trump personally, I'm going to vote to make my community and my country less safe. You know, President Trump has a perfect opportunity as the law and order president to be the complete opposite of what they are. And if they're going to continue to push this defund the police movement, um, I think more and more and more people, I mean, look, when you have 80% of black voters saying, hey, leave the police alone, you know, <laughs> we don't want you to defund our police. Uh, I think well, that that's a big deal. Now, whether they're all going to come out to the polls, I don't know. President Trump won 8% of the black vote. If he doubles that, he's going to win this election, again, if they come out and actually vote. Um, I don't believe the polls that show that blacks are at 25%, 30%. It would be wonderful if they are, but I don't think that's the case. I think right now he's probably between 10 and 12%. And by the time election rolls around, if he can push that number to 14, 15, 16 percent and pretty much double where he was at, uh, he's probably going to win. He'll probably win pretty well, I, decent. I agree. I agree with what Josh said there about safety being the main thing uh, that the suburban mothers care about. Unfortunately, right now, they're looking at COVID as being the big bugaboo. And, if, and that's why I would counsel him if I were talking to him right now. I'd say, Mr. President, just stay very calm. Things are going to get better. We'll see better on the COVID front two months from now. Just stay calm. Don't look like you're the disruptor. And now people will start thinking about the economy and about the physical safety aspect in light of the right. So Josh is right on it. Safety is what suburban uh, mothers are going to care about. And I hope that works in the president's favor. But here's uh, the thing. They also understand that China caused this. How can you blame the president? He didn't create this virus, and he closed off China early, and he's going to remind voters 
and his surrogates are going to remind people of that, and he's going to say it in the debates himself that I saved hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives. So again, putting that all in context, I don't think the American people are necessarily blaming him for this virus. And uh, well, so they're I, blaming him for the way that. The, but let me butt in. They are blaming him, and a lot of it's coming from CNN and MSNBC and uh, the Post of the Times. They are trying to make a big deal that, like somehow, his handling of it has made it worse. His handling of it, and and they're hitting on that. So it, is, it does have some effect. I mean, if you look at the polls, they the polls do skew yeah. against President Trump, especially among suburban women, about his handling of the crisis. And so I'm not faulting him for it at all. I believe exactly what Josh said, and I think he's right on. It's a question of perception. And my point is that he should do as little as possible to make himself a target. And if he can just keep his uh, fire away from that and not talk about Deborah Birch or Anthony Fauci, just be cool about it and, and, and aim his fire somewhere else, he'll be fine. If he can have that same discipline, if you remember he had that discipline in the waning days of the 2016 campaign and it worked. And if he can keep discipline now for just a couple months after Labor Day, he'll be cool. And uh, I think that polls are much tighter than they say they are. They're very close to being tied right now. They, they always are. Uh, I'd like to jump in, uh, Josh, who's just uh, an economist that I value that's been more right than anybody else. Uh, predicts by election day it'll be 6%. What will be 6%? The, uh, unemployment. That would be amazing. But no, he, wow. he, he really believes that. If, if, uh, anyway, uh, but I also uh, want to uh, point out something else. Just came across the wire. The Justice Department has found that Yale University discriminated against Asian Americans and whites, which has got to be a major change. I, I, I yeah. have, um, in, in fact, saying that uh, they discriminated against. Uh, since Thursday, they found Yale discriminates based on race and national origin, or origin, violating federal civil rights law. That is the first time I've seen that, and I think that's a major uh, event. What do you think? I mean, I agree. Uh, I don't. Yeah, Josh, I don't think ahead. it'll even get a blip on the news. To be quite honest, um, I think that, uh, and I've said this before, uh, white people can't really be victims in the year 2020. They can't be discriminated against. Uh, they can't be, you know, uh, prosecuted, prosecuted, you know, unfairly. unfairly. They just can't. They just I, mean, can't. The I mean, that's the way works. that that's it the works. The that's the way the media works, works unfortunately. unfortunately. Uh, uh, and sad. it's so sad. So maybe the Asians, maybe the Asians but probably not, probably not because they're, 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 you know, they're, they've never really, they've never been, really a been a class in the last 15, the last 15 20, years 20 years that's been... Uh, uh, you, know, the you know, the subject of discrimination as far as on a grand scale. So, so I, don't, I, I don't know. I think this will probably be just a passing type of story. I don't think it'll have legs. Don, who was the economist mentioned, you mentioned before? To back, uh, to back up, who was that economist or the uh, predictor on the unemployment? Oh, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't uh, at this point. <laughs> He can't reveal his sources. He's a journalist, for God's sake. Okay. I, got it. Okay, I, didn't hear it. I, didn't I love it. Okay. Okay. He shares that uh, with his clients and the charges <laughs> a great deal of money for it. And I just okay. have to. Okay. But, okay. but okay. Well, I will say okay. this that he, uh, he has been more consistently right on these numbers than anybody else over the last 10 years that I've worked with him. Well, as we wrap up here with, with Josh uh, on this segment, uh, tell us about AMAC and uh, your radio program and everything else, then we'll let you go and finish up with John here. AMAC is the Association of Mature American Citizens, uh, the Conservative, uh, the conservative alternative, alternative to AARP. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, lot of folks uh, don't know that there is another alternative out there for seniors. For seniors. You don't have to be stuck with the liberal organization of AARP. Uh, AMAC.us is the website. You can call them toll free at 888-262-2006. Again, 888-262-2006. Tell them you heard about AMAC on the Jiggy Jaguar program, and they'll even give you a free one 
on your introductory membership just for mentioning the Jiggy Jaguar program. Uh, and they are fighting to make sure that there's not Medicare for all. They're fighting against creeping Obamacare. When they lobby on behalf of seniors uh, with Washington, it's to have more power, more control, and more freedom in health care choices and decisions, not a top-down, government-bloated bureaucracy type of universal coverage or even worse, Medicare for all. So there is a group on the other side that's fighting against those big government programs on health care, and that is the Association of Mature American Citizens. Check them out on the web at amac.us. Fantastic. Well, Josh, I appreciate you joining us, and uh, thanks for being with us today, my friend. I really do appreciate it. You got it. You got it. Thank you, sir. There goes Josh Bernstein uh, from the josh bernstein show and uh we are going to continue on here with don mazella and john o'connor so uh so john tell me and uh, don a little bit more about your book postgate well what uh, i talk about is that i like many other people thought that the watergate reporting was spot on and it would usher in a new uh era of journalism, and uh, and I was always disappointed that uh, journalism was so bad in its wake. After I represented Deep Throat and got involved with the Washington Post and they put my head in the dumpster enough, I began investigating whether or not the Post reporting was really as good as they say. And in fact, through my book, I document how the Post committed deliberate uh, dishonesty in coverage of Watergate and made Watergate into a false one-ring circus when it should have been a three-ring circus, and uh, that Richard Nixon uh, was, in fact, yes, he obstructed justice on the advice of the great John Dean, but was also a victim of the CIA and the DNC and uh, a rogue and, and Dean and, and himself. But it, the main thing here is is that the Post committed fraud, far-reaching fraud, got away with it, elevated the status of journalists. You get rich, famous uh, everything else, if you can get a scalp, uh, they promoted journalists to an unaccountable fourth branch government, uh, which now necessarily is partisan. You're going to wear a jersey, you better be on one team or the other and get your scalp that way. So what I, what I show is, though, if I show, I figured if I can prove definitely, and I did this, that Watergate was a fraud, what about all the other reporting that follows? And it is much it, once you read mine, you realize that the fraud comes from concealment, from concealing material facts. That's what happened in Ukraine Gate, conceal Biden's corruption. Russia Gate, conceal the abuses of the FBI and the nothingness of the investigation. Yep. Conceal, conceal, conceal. And that is the method. And we all have to be on our toes. And like somebody said, we've got to call out the media. But once you see the post in action in my book, you realize their heart and soul. I talk about, you know, what came from the post. I have a, a pretty good uh, intro on that one. So it, it's good reading. I try to write it like a thriller. Uh, and for those people that love uh, facts and love inferences and circumstantial evidence and getting to the truth, I, I hope it's a pretty good read. I put a lot into 275 pages. There's a lot packed in there. <laughs> Uh, with the, the name of the book again, because I uh, I have to tell you I had a, a, an old line uh, editor that um, after the fact said one thing. All they had is one source, and and they they were uh, read into the ground. And, and it, well, I tell you, yeah, Don uh, and Don. One of the things you might want to do is is look and see what they had in front of them. They deliberately chose to conceal. That's what's frightening, including some of the stuff that Mark Felt told them. Remember, my, the title of my book is Postgate, How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and Began Today's Partisan Advocacy Journalism. A lot of Deep Throat's uh, insights, they completely ignored and covered up. And they had it there, and that's just one of the things they covered up. But uh, So that's for, for you, Don, as, as a news guy, journalism guy, I think you'll be fascinated by what they did. Uh, I have to get the book now, uh, John. Uh, my editor at the time, Al DePolo, you, you know, uh, 
He said many of the things you just said. And, and uh, he was a, a, a news editor in Newark, New Jersey, and never got involved. But the, he, he, he just figured there was a lot more to the story. There was, and, and again, uh, why is it that it's taken 48 years for somebody to do this? Because it takes a lot of digging to, 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 to do this. It takes work, and, uh, and I'll tell you this. They may not have been able to get away with it if, it, if they're in the, in the age of talk radio and uh, the Internet, and I think there would have been a lot more blown up uh, back in those days. But one of the things the Post did prove, though, and that is still true today, is if you have control of the major media, you can pretty much dominate the conversation. Now, they wouldn't have dominated it today. They wouldn't dominate it completely, but, and they would dominate it in a different way. But they dominated it back then, and we never got the truth. And how can we have our history written that is completely fraudulent? But that's what we've got, people reading the wrong history in the school books. Well, but, but let me, uh, I guess my question simply is, um, to me, it was a totally unnecessary. If you win. Uh